Charles has just told you about all of the wonderful tricks and hacks and kind of random ideas that you need to do in order to convince um, these amazing models to do what it is that you want them to do. And next, we're going to talk about how to actually give them the data that you need that they need in order to answer whatever questions you want them to answer. Um, so the framing here is there's really a ton that language models don't know. So if you go into ChatGPT, even GPT-4, and you ask it who's the president of the United States, it's not going to be able to tell you the answer to that. Um, and so if we think about what language models are good at on their own, they're really good at, well, language understanding. They're really good at, newer models are good at following instructions. They're good at kind of basic reasoning. And for many of the more modern models, they're also very good at understanding code. But there's a lot of things they also need help with. They don't have up-to-date knowledge of the world. They don't know anything about your specific data. They don't do very well with more challenging reasoning, especially anything that looks like math. And they have no way of interacting with the world on their own. And so the, the mental model that we should have is that language models are sort of these, these, um, these engines for general reasoning. Um, they're not designed to have specific knowledge. And you know, it's unclear whether they ever will. Um, you know, OpenAI has been training larger and larger models for the past few years, but they still don't really train any models on data past 2021. And there's a reason for that, right? Which is because they, they don't think that the more recent data is actually going to help the model be that much better. So the way we can think of the language model is it's, it's the brain. And we have to give it tools um, and data so that it can actually do the tasks that we want it to do. So you can think about this as like, like a large language model is like, um, it's like you, but when you're in high school, right? You're probably really smart, um, but you don't know anything. Um, so um, in order to actually solve problems, um, you need some training, you need, some, uh, you, need, you need a calculator, and you need some other tools in order to actually do anything useful. Um, and so the, the baseline here is, you know, the simplest way that you can do this is just put more data in the context window. Um, so, you know, if I want a large language model to know who the president of the United States is, I can tell it what is the current date and who is currently the president of the United States. And if you do that, the model will pretty reliably be able to answer that, that type of question. Um, with the exception of things like hallucination, which uh, Charles was just talking about. And so the, the analogy here is like, if the model by itself is, you know, you when you were in high school, um, putting data in the context window is like when your teacher told you that you're allowed to like bring a cheat sheet into the exam, right? So you have this limited scratch pad where you can um, give this, uh, this, this, you know, smart but not knowledgeable high school student access to the information it needs to know in order to answer the exam questions. Um, so like the cheat sheet, the context window that you give the model only has access to a limited amount of information. How much information does it have access to? Well, um, the size of the context window of language models has been growing pretty consistently over the past few years and very rapidly recently. And so the, the, um, you know, a few years ago, most of these models had around 2,000 tokens, which is still what most of the open source models have today. And now the state of the art is you know, the yet to be released GPT-4 extension has 32,000 tokens. So how much data is that? Right? How, much, how much can you fit in your cheat sheet? Um, so if we kind of like do a logarithmic scale of different sizes of context windows, um, we can build some intuition about what fits into them. So if your context window is 50 tokens, that's roughly a sentence. At 500 tokens, that corresponds to roughly four paragraphs of writing. And for context, the original GPT, GPT-1, had about that much context. When you scale up to 4,000 tokens, which is what you get with GPT 3.5, chat GPT, and the, um, the sort of most state-of-the-art open source models, that's roughly kind of a long article or a long blog post. Um, 32,000 tokens, which is what you can put into um, the, the yet unreleased GPT-4 with 32K, that's kind of like a college thesis, like a short book. Um, and then as you scale up, you can fit more and more information. But even with several more orders of magnitude of scaling, um, if you get up to you know, 65 million tokens, which would require like, big advances in how we're able to use context windows, and today would be prohibitively expensive, that's still only roughly like 500 megabytes or so of, tech, of, of text data. And so for, for context, like if you're using a traditional search engine, um, a single elastic search node can fit 50 gigabytes of data. Um, so the takeaway here is, the context windows are expanding rapidly, and I think this is one of the biggest places where LLMs are advancing and will advance over the next couple of years. But in the grand scheme of things, they still are not gonna have access to a ton of data anytime soon. And so um, 
these are not going to fit everything that you need them to fit for a while. And of course, like putting more context in the model costs you more money because most of the API providers charge you per token, including the tokens in your context window. So what we'll talk about today is how to make the most of the fact that for the foreseeable future, we're going to have a limited context window. And we're going to talk about specifically how to do that, not by training models or fine tuning them, but by augmenting the language model with data or tools that I can use to answer the questions it needs to answer. So um, we're going to talk about kind of at a high level three different ways um, that you can do this. The first is retrieval, um, which basically just means augmenting the language model with an external corpus of data that it can search over to answer its question. Um, this is what we'll spend most of the time on today because this is, I think, like sort of the most mature of these techniques and the one where there's um, the most that the most depth that you could go into if you want to. Then we'll talk about chains. Um, so chains are a way of um, one mental model you can have for change is that these are a way of augmenting language models with the output of another language model. So how do you take a language model and use it to develop the context for another language model? And then finally, we'll talk about tools, which are ways for language models to interact with external sources of data um, that you don't have to curate yourself. And so really like the flavor of this, of this lecture is gonna be, this is an extremely deep topic. Um, I'm gonna try to give you sort of a whirlwind tour of some of the ideas that you might come across as you, um, as you, like, uh, as you uh, come across this problem and some like concrete recommendations about starting point. But um, there's a ton of depth here and I would encourage you to go into, into more detail about any of these things if you're interested to learn more. All right, starting with retrieval augmentation. Um, so we're gonna talk about um, sort of these topics and starting with, okay, why? Why are we talking about retrieval augmentation? So let's say that we want to give our model access to data that is in our database that corresponds to our specific users. And so the first approach that we talked about before would be to put it into the context. So I can give the model some context on the organizers of full stack deep learning. And if I do that, then the model will answer a question like, who on our team writes the prompts for our models? And it'll answer that correctly based on the title, that, um, the imaginary title that I gave Charles as our chief prompt engineer. But what happens if we have thousands of users, not just you know, three organizers? Um, so one thing that you might wanna do is you, you might just imagine like, hey, why don't we just use some rules to figure out based on the, the, the query that the user is asking, which da user data should go into our context. Um, so maybe you could put data from the most recent users into your context. Or if there's specific users that are mentioned in the query, you could put information about them in the context. Um, or maybe the most viewed users, or really any other heuristic that you can dream up. But the challenge with this is, what happens if the relationship between the query and the users that need to go into that data set is hard to describe just using you know, code and simple rules. Um, and so the, the takeaway here is that the, the process of building the context for your model, you should think about this as um, a form of information retrieval. So information retrieval is like the, the sort of, um, you know, I guess like wonkier way of describing search. Um, search is a kind of information retrieval, but your mental model for you know, putting the right data in the context for the model, you should think about that as kind of like a search problem. And so we'll expand a little bit on that metaphor. So if putting the data in the context is search, how can we do search? Um, so the first thing that we'll talk about here is tr the traditional methods for doing information retrieval before all this um, you know, deep learning craziness started. So a few basic definitions here. First, um, your user is gonna give you a query, which is a formal statement of what information they need. Then we have a bunch of objects that are contained in a collection of content. Um, an object, you can think of that as just a document, but it could also be an image or any other type of object that you want. We're gonna measure the relevance of these objects, which is basically how well this object, how useful this object is for our query. And then we're gonna take those relevant objects and we're gonna rank them based on some metric for desirability. And so all of information retrieval um, can sort of be boiled down to this process of taking a collection of objects, um, using a query to find the ones that are most relevant, ranking them against some criteria, and taking the most relevant ones that can fill the, the space that you have available um, to build, in this case, your prompt. In traditional information retrieval, the way that this normally works is you'll search for, um, for items via an inverted index. Um, and so you can think of it as inverted index as kind of like um, a really, really simple type of database where you take all of your text documents and you just extract the frequency of the words that occur in each of those text documents. So for uncommon words like winter, um, if a user asks a, a query that has the word winter in it, it'll just pull up the docs um, in, your, in your database that have the word winter in it as well. So it's a very good heuristic for 
um, finding documents, especially when there's uncommon words. And then in traditional search, the way that ranking and relevance works is, you know, typically you'll do relevance via Boolean search. So you can just exclude a lot of documents that have nothing to do with the reason why you're asking this query to begin with. Um, so, you know, for example, you could just exclude documents that don't contain specific words. So if you remember, like, in the early days of, of searching the internet with Google, um, you know, everyone told you to use Boolean search, right, which is, which is this process, where you're, you're excluding a whole bunch of things from your search process that are just not relevant. Once you have the relevant documents, then you do ranking, and typically the most common algorithm for ranking is called BM25. You don't need to know the details of this, but um, it's interesting to know the main factors that influence this, um, and these are all very simple heuristics. Like, the more frequently your search term appears in the document, the more relevant it is, um, the higher ranked it should be. The more objects, um, the more documents that contain your search term, the less, rel the more, less important that search term is, because this is just a common word that might be in all the documents. And then lastly, if a document contains, you know, um, really short, uh, like, it contains your word in a really short um, sentence, then that means that word's probably more important for the document or the sentence as well. Um, and then the last thing I'll say on traditional search is, um, and this is, this is relevant later because it has analogies to when we talk about vector databases, which I think is how most people in LLMs are talking about search today. Um, search engines, like if you search on Google or Elasticsearch, that's a lot more than this just simple inverted index data structure that we just described. Um, and so search engines need to not just store the data in a way that you can retrieve it easily, they also need to be able to ingest documents, they need to be, need to be able to process them to remove stop words, um, put everything in lowercase and things like that. They need to handle transactions. So what happens if you add or delete a document? How does the database manage that? Um, they need to be able to scale up and down. Uh, they need to be able to scale horizontally. Um, and they need to have the algorithms built in for ranking and relevance. So a search index is kind of like a, a data structure that allows you to quickly run these, quer these simple queries to find documents. And a search engine wraps that with a bunch more functionality. Now, um, why, um, why are we talking about things more complicated than just traditional search? Um, the, the search that you can do in you know, Elasticsearch as of five years ago. Well, there's some pretty fundamental limitations to this type of search. First, it only really models simple statistical correlations between the words in your query and the documents, um, things like word frequencies. It doesn't capture any semantic information. It doesn't capture the cross correlations between these terms. And so it's, it's really kind of this like dumb heuristic that is um, very useful, but um, you know, for, for ambiguous statements, like searching for what is the top hand in bridge, um, you might get documents that have to do with all of the different uses of the word bridge, rather than the way that we mean bridge here, which is bridge the card game. Um, so that's kind of a whirlwind tour of traditional search. And next thing that we're gonna talk about is doing a more sort of AI-centric approach here, which is to do information retrieval via embeddings. Um, one kind of thing to note here is that, um, you know, we've been talking about search as a, um, as a way to improve AI. So search as a way of building the context so that your model can answer the important question that you have for it. But what we're gonna be covering in this section is how AI also helps improve search. So how large language models and um, models like that can um, help us themselves retrieve better data from the context. Um, so first we'll talk about what are these things, like what do we talk about when we say embeddings. Then we'll talk about um, you know, the analogy to these traditional search indexes, these inverted ind indices. Um, we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about indices for, for nearest neighbor search. And then we'll talk about the equivalent to, you know, moving up beyond the inverted index and building a database on top of it. And we'll talk about embedding databases. And then finally, we'll talk about how to go beyond some of the naive algorithms that we'll cover in the first section of this, uh, this part that we're covering. So, first of all, what is an embedding? An embedding is an abstract, dense, compact, usually fixed sized and usually learned representation of data. So what does that all mean? Well, in the traditional search world that we were just describing, um, we are constructing what you can think of as a sparse representation of the document that you wanna search over. So when we see a document, we look at each of the words in that document, and if a certain word is contained in that document, we flag it. So this document here can be represented by the fact that it contains the word coffee. It contains the word T and it contains the word laptop. 
And embedding is a dense representation of this document. So it's, um, it's, it's not just modeling whether these words are present, but it's modeling more complex statistical distributions of all of the words in this document itself. Um, and so what this looks like concretely is an embedding is just a vector, um, a vector that um, contains some meaning about the, 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 the text in the document that it corresponds to. What are embeddings not? Um, so there's a lot of misconceptions about embeddings, and I won't talk about all of them. Um, would recommend checking out this blog post if you want to uh, learn more about this. But um, embeddings are not always necessarily the last learned layer of a neural network. That's a common misconception. Um, an embedding doesn't necessarily refer to a single input in your data set, um, although it often does. But embeddings don't have to be from a neural network at all. You can construct embeddings using all kinds of other techniques that have nothing to do with neural nets. And Embeddings don't even need to be directly comparable in a vector space. Um, so embedding is like a very general concept, but the way that we use them for the purpose of search and information retrieval in large language models is more specific. Why do we use embeddings? Like why are embeddings useful for information retrieval? I think that the core reason is because vectors are a very compact way of representing any type of data. So whether you have you know, a massive text document or an image or an audio clip or a video, any of those things can be represented by a vector. And you can construct those vectors in such a way that they're directly comparable with each other. So that's a really powerful idea, right? Because it doesn't matter how big your initial data was. It doesn't matter what format it was, whether it's MP3 or um, MP4 or something else entirely. Um, when these documents are represented by embeddings, they all take the same form and the same structure. Next thing I want to talk about is what makes a good embedding. So how do you know if you have the right embedding for your data? Um, and I think there's really two things that you can look to here. The first is the first and most important is utility for the downstream task. Um, so at the end of the day, in machine learning, a lot of times the way that we need to evaluate things is empirically. So how do you know if you have a good embedding? A good embedding is one that allows you to solve the problem that you're trying to solve at the end of the day. Um, and it's really important to think about this in the context of your specific task, the task that you, you are actually working on. Um, because general purpose embeddings are not as general purpose as large language models. Um, the, the, there are decent general purpose embeddings that we'll talk about in a second, but you can often do better than a general embedding on your specific task. So benchmarking embeddings, really critical to use the task that you care about. If you can't do that for whatever reason, um, a decent sort of second choice is to use a br like the broadest benchmark that you can. Um, and so there is a MTEB leaderboard that you can find on Hugging, Base, Hugging Face that contains like kind of an up-to-date ranking of um, the, the best embedding models on this like very general benchmark that covers many different use cases for embeddings. The other intuition for what makes a good embedding is that um, in, in the embedding space, a property that you want these embeddings to have is that similar objects should be close together, and objects that are really different from each other should be far apart. So for example, if you are constructing an embedding of a particular word, then you would want the, word, the embeddings for coffee and tea to be close together, because those are similar concepts for us. But the embeddings for ball and crocodile, if those are close together, that would be bad, because those have nothing to do with each other, um, at least in, in, uh, in most universes. So why is this important? Um, this is important because of what we'll talk about in a second, which is the algorithms that we use um, to, to leverage embeddings to build our input spaces for our, our large language models. So next thing I wanna do is kind of give like a quick tour of some of the most important embeddings to know about if you're going to be building stuff with embeddings. Um, the kind of original embedding for a lot of people is word to vec um, I won't talk about the details here, but at a high level, like word to vec is a pre-neural network embedding that tries to predict um, what, a, what a word is based on the surrounding context, the words that are immediately around it. Um, and so if you wanna kind of learn a little bit about the history of embeddings and build more intuition, this is a good one to study. The baseline that you'll probably look at when you start to build embedding-based models is sentence transformers. Um, sentence transformers encode um, two sentences um, and are trained using a softmax to try to make um, similar sentences close together. The great thing about sentence transformers is that they're really cheap and fast to run. They're widely available, they're kind of widely benchmarked, and they work decently well for a lot of applications. Um, if you wanna have an embedding that supports more than just text, the best option right now is Clip. Clip is a joint embedding space between text and images. Um, so you can do things like 
find similar images for a text query or find similar text for a given image. Um, for like actually sort of prototyping applications, I think the best starting point right now is OpenAI embeddings. Um, the one to use is text embedding ADA002. Um, this is kind of like near state of the art on most of the benchmarks. And the great thing is it's cheap, it's really easy to use, and it gets pretty decent results in practice. So unlike with like state of the art open AI models for language modeling, um, this is not gonna get you state of the art for your task, but it, what it is gonna do is give you like a pretty solid baseline um, that you can start to build on top of. And it might be good enough. Um, and then the last kind of, the last embedding model that I want to cover um, is called Instructor. This is the model that's at the top of the MTEB leaderboards right now. And it's interesting to learn about, not because you're probably gonna be using it anytime soon, but because I think it points to a little bit of the direction that embedding models are going into. Um, and so the way that Instructor works is, rather than just training your embedding model on raw documents, instead, you prepend a description of the task that you're trying to solve to the document before you embed it. Um, and then at the time that you, uh, um, that you like actually want to um, like get a new set of embeddings, you can just describe your task and then get tasks with specific embeddings because the model is trained to produce different embeddings depending on the task. Um, so the analogy that you can think of here is that this is kind of like the, the equivalent of instruction tuning um, for embedding models. So this is the model that hits state of the art on benchmarks. Um, I don't know of a lot of people using it in practice today, but it's, um, it's, it's an interesting one to look at if you're not getting good enough results from OpenAI. But if you really wanna squeeze the performance out of your embeddings, um, unlike for uh, LLMs where you know, fine tuning has um, more limited utility for just achieving high performance, off the shelf embeddings are a good start, but they are not gonna get you all the way there. Um, they're, uh, you know, approaches like Instructor I think will help, but for now, um, if you really care about getting the best data into your corpus, you really can't escape training an embedding model on your own. Okay, so we talked about embeddings, like what are these things, how do we create them? Next thing that we're gonna talk about is how do we use embeddings to answer this information, information retrieval question? Like how do we use them to pull the right information from our corpus and put it into the prompt? Um, so finding relevant objects with embeddings, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the object, our query object, we're gonna embed it, um, use it and we're gonna uh, create this, this vector, and then we're gonna search over an index of documents um, that's analogous to the, the, you know, um, the inverted index that we created in traditional search. And we're gonna search over that index to find the most similar objects according to a metric. What are the metrics that we can use? Um, there's a bunch of them. I would say the most commonly used one is cosine similarity, probably followed by dot product similarity. Um, OpenAI says that it doesn't really matter. Um, so I wouldn't pay too much attention to this. Now, um, minimal recipe for nearest neighbor search is, again, you've embedded your corpus. Um, you can just store your embeddings as an array, like as a NumPy array. Then embed your query, compute the dot product between this array of embeddings and the new embedding that you created for your query, and just find the minimum of that. So find the, the, the one that's the most similar to that, to, that, uh, to that query. And so this is like three lines of code that will do that. Um, and so the main thing that's doing work here is this first line, the similarities line, where we're um, just computing the, the matrix vector multiplication between our new vector that came from our new embedding and this array of all of our previous vectors. So um, that's it, now we've, we've, uh, we've solved similarity search and we can move on. Um, our question is like, okay, that feels kind of hacky. When do we actually need more than that? When do we need all these like embedding databases and things that you've probably uh, been hearing about on Twitter? So the reality is if you have less than 100,000 vectors or so, you're really probably not gonna notice the difference between um, just doing this in NumPy and having some fancy vector database. Um, so 100,000 vectors for a lot of tasks is quite a lot. Um, so you don't necessarily need to reach for a complicated tool in order to solve this problem. Above a certain scale though, it, it does make a big difference. Um, and I guess just if you don't believe me, I think the, um, in these days, if you wanna um, win an argument in machine learning, the best way to do so is to provide a screenshot of a tweet by Andre Karpathy. And so here's the, the requisite screenshot um, where Andre agrees with me. Um, okay, so sometimes you need more than just um, doing this in NumPy. And that's where approximate nearest neighbors come in. There's a bunch of algorithms for approximate nearest neighbors. You don't really need to know the, um, the differences between them, uh, but, we'll, uh, but 
the, at a high level, like the, the definitions here are um, an embedding index, like a inverted index, is a data structure. And that data structure lets us do this nearest neighbor search in an approximate way much faster. Um, there's a lot of different index types that are available that make different trade-offs between speed, scalability, and accuracy. Um, here are some of the kind of common algorithms that you might see. Um, you don't need to know the details of these, although it's really interesting if you do, do want to learn more. Um, at a high level, the way that they all work is they basically partition the space that you're searching over. So there are different ways of dividing up the space of all of the vectors that you want to search over. So you only search over the vectors that are most likely to be close to, um, to the, your query vector in some way. Um, there's also a bunch of tools that can help you do the, these, um, build these ANN, uh, these approximate nearest neighbor indices. Um, the most common ones that you'll see are probably uh, FACE, coming from Facebook AI, um, HNSWLib, and M NMBSLib, which are very similar libraries for the HNSW library, uh, HNSW algorithm, and ANNOY is another one. Um, there's also um, some really good benchmarks that uh, you can find online if you want to really study the performance trade-offs between these different databases and different indices. But um, you don't really need to know all of this because, um, at least not at first. Um, and the reason for that is because if you are just prototyping, it really doesn't matter which one you choose. You're not going to have tens of millions of vectors um, where you really need to care about these performance trade-offs. You can even just use NumPy if you want to. And when you're productionizing, then the much more important choice is not the underlying index, um, but it's actually the broader information retrieval system that that index is part of. Um, that being said, if you do have to choose an embedding index, um, then a very reasonable choice is just to use uh, FACE and HNSW. Um, and so that kind of answers the question if you do want to pick something. But I want to focus more on this question, which is, you know, why do I say that it doesn't really matter which index you choose? Because you should be choosing not an index, but an information retrieval system. That's because just like um, inverted index indices have a lot of limitations when it comes to traditional search, ANN indices also have a parallel set of limitations when it comes to, um, to vector search. And the main issue with them is that they're just a data structure. They don't offer hosting. They don't store data and metadata alongside of the vectors. Um, they don't let you combine this dense retrieval, right, this nearest neighbor lookup with sparse retrieval filtering. They don't manage the embedding functions themselves. They don't scale up vertically or horizontally. Um, and so when you go beyond prototyping and you're really ready for production, you're probably going to want an information retrieval system that, um, that supports more of these limitations. And so the, the analogy that you can think of is like, if um, how many of you have ever been to a library before? Well, wow, shockingly small number. Um, the, uh, you can think of an index as kind of like the card catalog in the library. Oh, how many of you have ever been to a library with a card catalog? This is a better question. Oh, still some people. Okay, cool. I'm not that old. Um, the, so the card catalog, um, for those of you, uh, you know, who are on TikTok, um, the card catalog was a, was a thing that used to be in libraries where you could go and like look up the, the, the name of the author of your book and find out where in the library that book was located. Right? So the, the index is kind of like the card catalog. It just tells you, you know, where on your hard drive does the data that matches this query live. Um, but the database is kind of like the whole library. Right? So it has the support staff, it has the books themselves, it has all the other functionality that the library has, you know, the, the, um, the, the late checkout cards um, and uh, all that stuff. We talked about like how to search over vectors um, and then we sort of made the analogy that like just being able to search over vectors, like just having um, face or uh, NumPy is really not gonna be that great for production. Um, so the next thing we'll talk about is databases that let you actually do this in a more reliable production oriented way. Um, and I think the first and probably most important thing to take away from this is just a question, right? Which is for what you're doing right now, um, do you actually need an embedding database? Or is what you need just a database? Okay, so um, why do I ask that question? Well, um, approximate nearest neighbors is an algorithm um, that is supported by data structures. Um, these algorithms and data structures are pretty simple. They're open source. Anyone can implement them. Um, and they're pretty popular. And that means that the database that you use um, might already have um, an embedding index built into it. So if you use Postgres, um, there's a library called PG Vector that um, add, adds approximate nearest neighbors support, uh, search support to Postgres. Um, Elasticsearch has support for this now. Redis has support for this now. And probably most of the other 
um, uh, databases, popular databases that you might be using um, have support for this or will add it soon. Um, and so this won't work for the most complicated potential queries that you might run or the highest possible scale that you want to reach. But for you, it's probably going to work. Um, so my recommendation is just use your existing database for approximate nearest neighbors. Um, the database you want is probably the one you're already using, yeah. Um, but, um, okay, if you do really want something more advanced than that, then um, let's talk about where you might go next. So the dream of how this would work, the dream of how information retrieval for building the context for your model would work is you dump in a bunch of data. Um, that data could be all kinds of different things, documents, uh, images, et cetera. Um, you run a query, so you ask for you know, descriptions of recent concerts in the Bay Area, and then you just get the most relevant results back automatically. Right? Um, so unfortunately, there's a lot of like, complexity that goes behind um, actually being able to build a system like this. And so some of the big challenges are, um, you know, okay, we wanted to just be able to dump in a bunch of data. But in order to do that, we need to kind of be able to handle sort of traditional database concerns like scale and reliability. And we also need to handle the managing of the embedding function itself. So what embeddings do we use? How do we version them? And how do we split up documents to fit into the embedding? Um, when it's time to run a query, the main question is like, how do we specify that query? And um, when it's time to get the most relevant data back, there's all kinds of different search algorithms that might make the most sense depending on all the choices that you made before. So there's a lot of complexity here. Um, database stuff, you know, um, scale, reliability. Um, there's uh, many, many um, uh, books and courses, um, a whole academic career that you can build just on studying these questions um, in the context of databases. For managing the embedding, um, you know, there's the question of like, which embedding should we use? What happens if we want to change the embedding function, which becomes very relevant if you're training your own embeddings? Um, how do you um, take documents and split them up so they're small enough to fit in the context window of the model that, um, of the embedding model itself? Um, and so the way that document splitting works is typically you'll pick some separator for your text. You'll split your text by that separator um, up to the maximum size that you can fit in the context window for the embedding model itself. Um, and usually that's the way that people do it. There's more advanced things that you can try here. Um, so for example, you can, um, you know, one issue with just splitting things up naively is you might split a document up in the middle of a thought um, that the author of that document had. And so how do you avoid that so that these like chunks of documents are, are like actually meaningful chunks? Well, there's some techniques using more traditional statistical methods to try to make the chunks themselves semantically consistent. Um, so that's a, a thing to look into if you're having that issue. Um, for the query language, you know, just asking for the most similar documents, that's easy. So you just take the document that you, that you want the most similar documents to, and you ask, hey, what, which embeddings are closest to this? But if you want to filter on other meta metadata, like I only want recent data, or I want to upweight recent data, or um, if you don't actually have a document that you want to compare to, you just have like a search string or you know, a request for a summary or something like that, um, then building, like, create, like uh, deciding how users can specify these queries becomes harder. And then lastly, um, you know, how to, when you're actually searching over this data, um, oftentimes the data has hierarchical structure. So the simplest and most common example of that is, let's say that you're dealing with very large documents um, and you can't fit the entire document into the context window of the embedding model. So you have chunked the, those documents up into shorter chunks that can each be embedded. Now the database that you've built has structure to it because the individual chunks um, all have this consistent property that they belong to a single document. And so the problem is when you're searching over um, chunks rather than searching over documents, you might get behavior that like may or may not be desirable, like your top three or four results might all be from the same document. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Well, it really depends on the task that you're trying to solve. And so these, these um, sort of, these properties of structure of the data that you're, you're storing and searching over um, really matter if you're trying to maximize the quality of the information that you find to put in the model's context. Um, and, um, and so, you know, I think the thing to take away from this is that there's sort of infinite complexity of how much you can go in and explore this question of like getting the best and most relevant data from my corpus to put into the context. Um, and so probably you don't want to actually just build all this stuff yourself. Um, if you're looking for like really advanced features for searching over documents, 
you probably want to actually go and look for one of these embedding databases. Um, and so here are, I think, like kind of the most common ones. Um, and for each of these, you know, um, kind of laid out some of the more prominent users, or at least the ones that have been announced publicly. Um, and then the way I would think about distinguishing between these is based on a few different features. Um, so first is these database-like features, um, which is, you know, how well do they scale? Um, how well do they handle insertions and deletions and questions like that? And so most of the databases, most of the, ve the vector databases on the market today, um, except Chroma, which is just very early, um, all have these database features because they are, after all, databases. Um, a second kind of feature that distinguishes these is whether they support embedding management. So if you, um, like, again, if, if we're thinking about our um, NumPy approach, we needed to actually, like, call the embedding function ourselves to produce the embedding that's going to be saved in the array. Um, and, like, one of the feature, like, the features that distinguishes these options is who is responsible for calling and managing that embedding function? Is it me, like, the user of the database? Do I have to run my embedding function before I put the data in the database? Or does the embedding function get called in the database itself? Um, and so some of these options um, support calling the embedding in the database, and others require you to call the embedding function. Another feature that distinguishes these is the ways you can do filtering. Um, so oftentimes, just searching over your entire corpus of documents is really inefficient because there might be um, just really easy ways that you can exclude a lot of those documents that are just not going to be relevant to your search. Really old documents, documents that have nothing to do with the question that you're asking. Um, and so most of these databases support some degree or another of pre-filtering documents before you run your more expensive nearest neighbor search operation on them. And then lastly, another kind of um, desirable feature for, for these databases is to have like a really robust built-in old school search, like old school full text search. Why is that important? Because um, you know, those algorithms are still really good and they're much more reliable than vector search alone. Um, so it can make things more efficient or, more, or even more accurate to combine vector search with um, traditional search. So what are, like, what are the recommendations here? Um, I think, you know, gonna go through these one by one. Um, Chroma, I think, is just a little bit too early to tell. Um, I think you would use this if you wanna bet on like the most AI native tool in the category. Um, this, this, uh, this is the one company here that was really started from the beginning with thinking about AI in mind. Um, Milvis, I think, is a really good choice if what you're optimizing for is scale or like enterprise considerations. Um, Pinecone has fewer features than the other options and does not have an open source option either. Um, it's kind of hosted only. And so Pinecone is really best if you want to get started very quickly. Uh, Vespa is one that I hear talked about less in sort of AI circles, but Vespa is, among all of these, the most feature rich, the most robust, and the most battle tested. Um, it kind of came from the last generation of search engines, but has been kept up to date with some of the more modern AI features. And then lastly, Weaviate um, is a really good mix between some of these options. Um, it supports embedding management, and it has a pretty flexible query interface. Um, and so if you, want, if you want those features in your database, that's a good option. So more concrete recommendations. Um, when you're ready to move on from prototyping, um, the recommendation is just use whatever database you're using already. If you don't have one of those databases, um, but you want to build a prototype quickly, then Pinecone is great for speed of setup. That's why we use it in this course. When you're ready to upgrade, then you just need to think about why. Like, why do we actually need to upgrade here? If it's for more flexible queries, then Vespa and Weaviate are the most, um, most full-featured options there. If it's for scale or, uh, or reliability, Vespa and Milvis seem to be the best options on the market. Um, and that was the last bullet point. Any questions? Yeah, so I think what I'll do is finish embeddings, and then we'll let people take a break, and we will, uh, we'll wrap this up later. So, um, okay, so I, I want to just really quickly touch on going beyond nearest neighbor embeddings. So the problem is, you know, a common problem is that your queries and your documents are not the same, right? So your queries are short questions, your documents are these like long form text. Um, and so that means that the embeddings between these queries and the documents are really not that comparable. Um, your data, um, and also on top of that, your data might be totally different than what the embedding model was pre-trained on. Um, so there's a bunch of approaches to, uh, to address this. I'm not going to talk about these in detail, um, but there's a, a, a really great blog post summarizing this if you want to take a look. Um, at a high level, some of the things you can do are um, you can train uh, your own model that jointly represents both the queries and the documents that you want to search over so that they're all embedded in the same embedding space and, the, and it's, a, it's a more apples to apples comparison. You can do hypothetical document embeddings which is kind of the idea that we talked about earlier where you take your query, you ask a model to imagine 
the document that this, that, uh, that this query might contain the answer to, and then you find the most similar documents to that imagined document. Um, and then there's a bunch of techniques that are all in kind of the general category of re-ranking, which is you search over a lot of documents, you return a lot of results, and you train a model to reorder those results based on the specific criteria that you're trying to search for. So um, if you are not getting good enough results from nearest neighbor search, then it's worth looking into some of these more advanced options. Um, another problem that we alluded to before as well is that you might actually have some structure to your data. So you might, um, so searching over the entire index might not be very efficient. And um, instead you might want to search in a way that respects that structure. So you might want to search over, you know, only the subset of your data that, um, you know, uh, comes from your Notion database or only the subset that comes from Twitter. Um, or only the more recent subset. And there's a, a library for this that's gaining a lot of popularity called Llama Index. Um, what Llama Index does is it combines um, the process of retrieving documents, so like loading data from Notion or Twitter or whatever, um, with the process of building these, um, these embeddings that are designed to be searched in this more hierarchical way. Um, cool. And so I guess last thing to talk about on um, retrieval augmentation is some case studies. First one that I want to talk about is Copilot. Um, so Copilot, um, I think probably all of you here have uh, used Copilot or heard of Copilot. How does Copilot work? Um, really there's like I think two secrets to Copilot. The first is, the first and like less interesting for this purpose is speed. Um, so one of the reasons Copilot is so magical is because it just returns things very quickly. Um, so we don't we don't care as much if it gets the right answer because we don't have to wait for it. But the other secret to Copilot is how they put the relevant context um, into the model so the model can predict what type of code you're trying to write. Um, and there's, uh, we can split this into the, like, kind of the general process of information retrieval. So first of all, where do, where do, they, where do the, like, um, the possible options for code snippets to pull in come from? Um, Copilot just looks at the most recently 20, like most recently accessed 20 documents that are in the same programming language that you're currently working with. Um, that gives you a corpus of things that you can use to find um, the, the snippet that you, that you want to actually generate. Um, on top of that, there's a lot of post-processing that happens. Some of the things that are going on there are, um, you know, it looks at what is happening right before or after your cursor. Um, it looks at each of the candidate docs and it tries to find the most relevant snippet from each of those candidate docs to reduce the amount of information that um, it needs to search over. And then finally, there's a ranking process where all of these things, so the, the um, code right before or after your cursor, the most relevant snippets from the most recently accessed docs, and a few other heuristically accessed sources of data are sorted in, um, in, in an order given by heuristics. And then the top few in that, in that sort order are, um, are, are put into the prompt for the model, and that's how they generate the, the code um, that you get as the output of Copilot. And so one takeaway here is that like Copilot is an extremely powerful tool that uses very, very simple methods for retrieval. Um, and I think that's an important lesson because I think oftentimes like folks want to reach for you know, vector nearest neighbor search, but actually just starting with heuristics and using those heuristics to pull the most relevant information might be a better starting point and might actually work a lot better. Um, the other reason, by the way, that they do this is because since they're so latency constrained, um, they are avoiding like having expensive operations in the loop wherever they can. Um, and then the other pattern I want to cover is the, a pattern that's becoming really common, which is question answering using retrieval augmentation. So the way this works is, let's say that I have a bunch of data that's specific to my company. Um, that data might be, let's say, all of the data in our Google Docs or in our Notion or in our company Slack. And then as a user, I want to ask a question and have the model answer based on the information that's contained in that corpus. So we'll take this, this question, like when was our company founded? We will compute an embedding. Then we will look in an index to find the most similar documents. So these are the most similar snippets of all of our Notion or Notion documents, or they're the most similar Slack messages to the question that was asked. Um, and then the information from those documents, those top three or four or five documents, are then dumped into the prompt. And the prompt, um, looks at both the original question that was asked as well as the documents that come from this, uh, this really simple search and it uses those to answer the question. Um, and in a perfect world, it's able to find the answer to the question really well from that. Um, so just like as a teaser of some of the stuff that we'll talk about later, 
one of the big limitations here is that you're really trusting this search process. So if you have millions of documents or millions of Slack messages, um, but you only have room in your context for a few, then you're relying on the search process to always turn up the, the documents that actually contain the answer to the question. Um, and so one way to potentially get around this limitation is to add, just add more models, add more models into the loop. Um, so what you could do is, even if you only have room for like three documents in your, in your query, um, in, your, in your context rather, what you could do is you could just basically iterate over documents. So you only have room for three, but you pull 10 or 20. And then you call um, an LLM on each subset of three, like each, um, each sort of chunk of three documents, and you ask the LLM to answer the question. Um, and then you feed to the next LLM, not only the three documents that it's responsible for parsing, but also the answer that the last LLM output. Um, and so by doing that, you have like, made the process much slower and much more expensive, because you're now calling OpenAI a bunch of times, but you've gotten around this limitation of only being able to fit a few things into the context window of the model. Um, and so we will talk more about that when we talk about uh, chains, which are sort of a way of generalizing this idea of, hey, maybe actually models are a great, great way to build the context for other models. Diving in yesterday, for when we left off yesterday in um, giving LLMs access to external information, so augmented language models. So today, what we're gonna talk about is other ways um, other than retrieval to add information to the context for your model. So um, last time we kind of ended by talking about this common pattern that you'll see in these retrieval-based models, which is this question answering pattern. So you start with a query that your one of your users asks, like, when was our company founded? You embed that, and then you compare that embedding to the embeddings that you've stored in an index or a vector database to find similar documents. You take as many similar documents as you can find, you shove them into the context for your language model, and you prompt the language model to use the context and the question to try to answer that question based on the information that you retrieved from your vector database. So this is a really common pattern. Um, this is, you know, it seems like kind of the, the to-do list app of language model applications. It's the thing that everyone seems to get started with when they're, they're building an app for the first time for good reason, right? It's a really powerful pattern, really simple to set up. But um, there's kind of a key limitation here, which is that you're really relying on your retrieval system. So if let's say that you only have enough room in your context to fit three documents, then if the right information is in your corpus, but it doesn't pop up in those three documents, um, you are out of luck, right? Your model is not going to know how to answer the question. Um, and so how do we deal with this? Well, one way that we can deal with this is we can, um, you know, just really, really focus on improving the quality of our information retrieval system. So we can add more and more advanced search features um, to make sure that the, the three documents that are returned are always the three documents that have the answer to the question. But um, another approach that you can take here is to add additional processing into the loop. Um, and so we talked about you know, one way that you could get around this limitation. And the way you could get around this limitation is, let's say that you ask your information retrieval system, not just for three documents, um, but for 10 documents. You can't fit all of those 10 documents into your context because you only have room for three. So what do you do? You take those 10 documents and you apply further post-processing to those documents via another call to an LLM. So what you might do is you might like construct a prompt that asks the LLM, hey, um, is the answer to the question that the user asked in this document? One simple approach. There's many others that you could take. And um, given like using that approach, what you can do is you can find among those 10 documents that were returned by you know, this, uh, this nearest neighbor search algorithm, which you can think of as this like really fast, but like kind of dumb um, algorithm for looking for similar documents. You then have applied this really slow, but really smart system on top of it, which is, in, which is you know, a GPT 3.5, GPT 4, a large language model um, that is answering the question of like, hey, among these 10 documents, which ones should I put into my context? That's kind of like a, you know, a brute force-like approach to, um, to you know, helping make sure that you have the right context that you put into your model. Um, the trade-off that you're making here, obviously, is you're making more calls to your language model, which is going to make this process slower and more expensive, uh, but can also really increase the quality. And so um, observation here is that this approach, of, say, returning 10 documents from your corpus and then applying post-processing to them via another LLM before sending them to your final prompt, this is an instance of a broader pattern called chains. So I think of chains as um, a way of asking another language model to help you define the context 
for the language model that produces the output that you're trying to produce for your task. Um, and so the way to think about this is, you know, sometimes the best context for your LLM is not easy to find directly in your corpus. Um, and so, you know, again, if you think of the, the, um, the context that you're providing to the model as like the cheat sheet that you give to, you know, the, the teenager who's, uh, who's taking the math exam, then, you know, um, sometimes it helps to have like another really smart teenager help you build the cheat sheet from all the information that you have. And so you can think of chains as, um, chains are basically ways of sequencing language model calls where you take the output of one call and you pass it as an input to another call. And one mental model you can have for this is if the final call in your chain, it, you can think of that as like the language model that is intended to solve the task that you're trying to solve. And then the, the previous calls um, to the language model are ways of using a language model to help develop the right context so that that final step in the chain has all the information that it needs to answer the question. So there's a wide range of different patterns for building chains that go beyond the one that we just talked about. So, you know, one example is the question answering pattern. So even if you don't apply another language model in the loop, you can still think of this as an example of a chain. The first step in the chain is you take the question and you compute an embedding. The second step in the chain is use that embedding to look up similar documents. And the third step in the chain is your question answering prompt. But chains can get much more complicated than this. Um, we talked yesterday briefly about hypothetical document embeddings, where you take the question that the user asked, you ask a language model, hey, given this question, generate a document for me that looks similar to the other documents in my corpus, but, can, um, but contains the answer to the question. And so the language model, language models are really good at sort of imagining um, alternate universes, as Charles put it. So the language model will basically invent a document that um, it thinks might have contained the answer to the question. Then you can embed that into, uh, into your embedding space, run your nearest neighbor search, and run that through a prompt to find similar documents. And sometimes that can improve the process of retrieval. So hypothetical document embedding is another example of this chain pattern. Another, pat another example of the chain pattern is you can um, start with a corpus of documents. You can, for example, if you want to summarize the entire corpus of documents, you have thousands of documents that don't fit into the context of your LLM. What you can do is basically apply kind of a map reduce sort of process where you apply a summarization prompt to each document independently. And so what you get is short summaries of many long documents. And then you can, rather than passing the documents to your summarization model, you can pass the summaries to the summarization model. And the summarization model then looks at all of the summaries of each of the individual documents and summarizes the summaries to give you an overall summary of the entire corpus. That's another example of a type of chain that you can build by connecting these language model calls together. Um, there's a tool that is becoming extremely popular for building chains of models. How many have used Langchain? Like pretty much everyone, cool. Okay, so you don't need me to tell you about this. Um, but it's uh, Langchain is one of the fastest growing open source projects of all time. Um, might have, I'm not sure if it was the fastest, um, but I think like AutoGPT is now the fastest. Um, language Langchain is up there. It supports both Py Python and JavaScript. Um, should you use Langchain? I, I think my answer to that is Langchain is definitely the fastest way to get started building these types of applications. Um, you can use it in production. Many folks that I talk to end up rolling their own um, sort of chaining, maybe drawing inspiration from Langchain or um, pulling in some of the prompts from Langchain or something like that. And the reason why I think a lot of people end up doing that is because, you know, if you know what problem you're trying to solve, it's really not that hard to sort of write the code to construct the chain to solve it. Um, what's hard is, you know, knowing the, sc the space of possibilities. Like what are the different types of chains that people have dreamed up that you might want to apply to problems like this? And that's, in my view, really the problem that Langchain solves is um, giving you all the ideas about here are the different um, chains that people have, have uh, dreamed up to solve different types of tasks. And they're great about incorporating things that people um, come up with really, really fast. And so it's a state-of-the-art repository of all the different chains that you might want to apply. And it also contains some um, nice boilerplate code and abstractions for building this stuff yourself as well. So should you use Langchain? I think make your own choice there. It's a, if you're just getting started or prototyping, I think you should absolutely use it. And then, um, but just know that it's, it's, uh, it's also relatively easy to build your own system if you find yourself needing to do that for production. Langchain, I think like one of the best things about it is it contains tons of different examples of types of chains. Here are some of them that you can find there. Um, but I would also encourage you to just like poke around the repo, 
It's great for generating ideas of the types of things that you can do with this chaining pattern. You know, we've been talking a lot about information retrieval search as a way of sort of building context for your model to answer questions. And, you know, one thing that, um, one thing that I thought when I first hear, heard about this is, wait a second, like, why are we building our own search engine here? This seems kind of silly. Like, can't we just use Google? Um, so it turns out you can. Um, here's a chain that you can, like, I would call like the feel, I'm feeling lucky chain. So let's say that you uh, have, your user has a question. Then what you can do is you can search Google for that, the answer to that question. Um, you can get the top result. You can pass that result to a summarization prompt, and then you can return the summary to the user. So this is a, this is a pattern that like might make for an interesting like sort of demo application. Um, but the insight here is another way to give LLMs access to the outside world, in addition to, you know, um, building an information retrieval system yourself, is just to let them use tools, give them access to APIs, that give them information about the outside world. And so one question you might ask is like, how far can we take this? What are the different ways that we can use this pattern? Um, so I think the, the paper that sort of is the uh, like most common citation here is Toolformer. So in Toolformer, um, they constructed a method where they give an LLM access to certain tools. Um, and so these tools included things like a calculator, question answering system, um, and, uh, a translation system, et cetera. And they trained the model in such a way that it was able to use those tools as it generated, generated the response. And uh, therefore, if it used the tools to, gen to generate a correct response, it learned, to, it learned that this tool is a useful thing if I want to answer questions like this going forward. Um, this paper, like sort of, I would say maybe formalized an idea that people had been talking about on Twitter for a long time before that. It's kind of a kind of, uh, common phenomenon in the lang language model world these days. Um, and so it's, it's, the results of this paper are kind of limited. Like it's only a few tools. It, it's a self-generated data set. The results are not really that special, but it's sort of the formalization of this idea that had, I think has been in the air in the LLM world for a while. You can use tools in Langchain. Um, there's basically two ways to use them. The first is you can use them like any other element in the chain. So you can use them in a deterministic way where you say, hey, um, let me take the output of this LLM, pass this to a tool, pass that output to another LLM, et cetera. Um, or you can use them in a way that looks more like OpenAI plugins, which I'll talk about in a second. So some of the examples of tools that you can give your, your uh, model access to in Langchain, um, archive, you know, search, uh, you can give them access to a Python interpreter, which can be really powerful um, if you want to do things that LLMs are traditionally not very good at, like math, um, things like that. And uh, there's all kinds of other things here. It's, it's like very easy to add a tool to the LLM because it's essentially just making an API call. So one example um, tool chain in Langchain is the uh, is like for querying SQL. So I think a common pattern that people have that people want to do with LLMs is they want to ask a question in natural language and get a response from their SQL database. So the way that you can set this up with a chain that involves tools is you can take the user's question, you can put the question um, alongside some metadata about the database that you want the model to be able to access into a prompt. That the the purpose of that prompt is to map the question and the, the database metadata to a SQL query. Then you can actually execute that SQL query on the live database, get the response from the database, and pass that response alongside the original question to another language model. So now this language model has access to the question that the user asks, as well as the result of the SQL query on your database. Um, and it's able to use that to answer the question. So this is just one of like many examples. And again, I think you know, the best way to learn about chains is to just go look at a bunch of examples of chains. Um, and it's infinitely, um, there's infinite possibilities of things that you can do with these. And so it's helpful to see what other people have come up with. So there's a more automated approach to doing this. Like what we just described is a method where you as the developer of the system manually design the way that the language model has access to these tools that interact with the outside world. But there's a more automated approach to this um, that's like sort of being, becoming referred to as plugins. Um, and this is the way that plugins work in ChatGPT. Um, so the chain-based approach, you start with a query, 
um, you pass that query to a uh, language model. That language model is designed to format the result of that query to be passed to the tool. Then you call the tool, which is like an API call or call to some external method. Um, you pass the result of that to a language model and to an output. And so these chains can get more complex than this, but this gives you a general idea of like, you as the, as the developer are designing this pattern of how the model gets to interact with the tool. The plugin-based approach is, um, is simpler than this. You take a query, you call an LLM, and that LLM gets to decide whether it wants to interact with the tool to answer the question or not. So rather than you as the developer telling the model where it should use the tool or where it shouldn't use the tool, instead, the language model gets to decide whether this tool is something that's going to be helpful for solving the task or not. So this is the approach that is uh, taken in Toolformer and is the approach that's taken by plugins in OpenAI. So you might ask like, okay, how can we make this more concrete? How do, how do you create a plugin? How does a plugin work? The way a plugin works is, in OpenAI at least, is you provide an API spec and a description of the API. The description of the API is designed not for the humans, but for the model. And so the description of the API is meant to help the model decide, you know, when is it actually going to be useful to use this API or not. Then what OpenAI does behind the scenes is it takes that description, it formats it, and it passes it to the model um, behind the scenes as part of its context. Then the model is able to use that context to make a decision given the other context, given the inputs that the users are putting in, is this tool going to be helpful to me to solve this problem or not? And so the model can choose to invoke the API. Um, and if it does so, the results from the API just get fed further into the context and the model can keep going. So the way to think about this is, um, you know, if you've designed a plugin, then behind the scenes, the model has access to the description of the plugin. Now, um, the next step is you ask a question, like ask a question to ChatGPT, let's say. Um, then what ChatGPT does is it thinks, okay, um, in order to answer this question, I would like to make an API call. It makes that API call, um, and the language model is paused, waiting for the API call to come back. When the API call comes back, that, um, the output of that API call gets dumped into the context, and then the model unpauses, and it keeps doing, it keeps trying to answer the question. So it now has access to, not just to the question, but also to the output of the API call that it decided to make because it thought it would be helpful for answering that question. And then it's able to sort of keep going with its generation to finish answering the question. Okay, so that was sort of a quick overview of some of the different ways that you can use tools um, as another way of augmenting the language model with external data. So what are recommendations here? Like how should you think about this concretely? Um, tools um, are a more flexible way to give your model access to external data. Um, so, and the way you can think about this is like, Retrieval is just one instance of a tool. So you can build a retrieval system. Um, you can, that can be based on any of these vector databases or just your database or any complicated system that you want to. Um, but at the end of the day, that's just one tool that you can give your model access to. So there's two different ways to build tools, uh, to build tool use into LLMs. The first is to, is to manually describe the logic for how the model should use, for how the system should use the tool um, in conjunction with LLMs to solve the problem. And then the second way is to use plugins where you just ask the LLM to figure it out for you. So which is better, um, chains or plugins? I think if, you, if your goal is reliability, like if your goal is to build a system that solves the problem the same way every time, then chains make more sense because you, um, you're, you, get to, you don't leave this up to the chance of what the model thinks is best. Um, on the other hand, if you want like interactivity and flexibility, like if you wanna build a really general purpose tool to give to your users that they can use to solve all kinds of problems that maybe you didn't anticipate, then plugins are great because um, they, the user doesn't have to, you know, pick a different chain to solve a different problem. In principle, at least the model can just pick the plugins that you designed that are most helpful for whatever intention that the user has. I guess the quick recap, LLMs are more powerful when they're connected to external data. Um, when you're connecting to external data, you know, you don't necessarily need to do anything complicated. You can just, you can do a lot with just rules and heuristics to tell the model, you know, which data is going to be most helpful for it. Um, as your knowledge base scales, you should start thinking about it as information retrieval. Um, chains can help you encode more complex reasoning. So if you need to do like a bunch of additional processing, you should start thinking about things as a chain. They can, chains can also help you get around token limits um, because you can, you know, uh, pass many different, like you can call the LLM many times, each with its own sort of set of tokens. This can get really expensive though. 
Um, and you know, tools are great for giving your model access to an external body of knowledge um, beyond maybe what you even have in your internal database. All right, um, that is it on augmenting language models. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.